Two-thirds of the world is covered by ocean that is still a valuable source of protein as the world's population explodes. The most valuable parts of the ocean are the shallow coastal areas. Fish and crustaceans need plants to eat and plants need sunlight to grow. This graphic shows two things. Australia is mostly desert and its rivers are feeble. Its eastern continental shelf is narrow, so the fishing is poor. Estuaries are places where rivers meet the sea. This is the Clarence River near Yamba on the north coast. This video will focus on estuarine tidal flats. This one is at Port Stephens draining the Karua River. Tidal flats are the area between the tides. Here the tide is out. Around 12 hours and 24 minutes later, the tide comes in again and the fish return. Aboriginal Australians migrated to this continent by land and watercraft during a glacial period over 40,000 years ago. When they first came to Port Stephens, the estuary would have been 6 kilometres out to sea and the sea level 120 metres lower. The immense size of our continent dictated that Aboriginal people would occupy around 300 clan areas. Each community working out how to survive in their own particular region. The fishing clans worked the estuaries. This is the famous Pemmel Way fishing the Parramatta River that formed Sydney Harbour. Scientists have plotted the global sea level rise since the last glacial maximum between 30,000 and 22,000 years ago. The sea rose dramatically and drowned our coastal estuaries. The narrow Parramatta River became Sydney Harbour. The Georges River was flooded, forming Botany Bay. The Hacking River was flooded, forming Port Hacking. On the north coast, the Walamba River formed the Foster River Delta. And the Karua River formed Port Stephens. Soldiers Point forms a choke point between the inner and outer bays that make up Port Stephens. This location faces the ocean and wave action has formed a white sandy beach and an estuarine tidal flat. At high tide, gulls and pelicans search for crabs and fish. Out to sea is a derelict oyster lease and some seagrass beds have survived with a sandy strip in between. At the south end of the beach is an outcrop of the local Carboniferous volcanic rock. At that end we find a number of marine algal species. Branching sea velvet, brown Neptune's beads and green sea lettuce. On the left is sea grass, which is not an algae, but a true grass that grows in the silt and can actually flower under water. Nearby we find some oysters that filter water for plankton and a green weed covered rock. This weed is collected and used for bait to catch luderic, which used to be called blackfish, they are mostly herbivorous plant eaters. Healthy estuaries have abundant seagrasses that provide cover for a number of animals. 
we see two ducks searching for a feed of small crustaceans and plant material on the edge of the seagrass bed. Further out I find a small blue swimmer crab, well camouflaged in the weed. His rear legs are paddle shaped to allow him to swim after small fish and crustaceans. They are good eating for humans and hide in the sand to avoid birds, large fish and large octopuses that live in large holes in the weed beds. On the sand flats we find small holes and balls of sand left by small crabs that graze on the leaf litter. These holes are formed by a small army of soldier crabs that emerge from their holes at dusk to advance and feed on the marine compost. When disturbed, they corkscrew into the sand. This poor little fellow has been damaged and is being attacked by nasty, biting, polychaeate worms and has little hope. The worms live in slimed burrows in the mud. Mud whelks grow in abundance on the estuarine mud and feed on the organic detritus on the surface of the mud. They are eaten by Aboriginal people and even by starving European early settlers. They have been discovered to be hosts for worm parasites that infect seabirds. This was a more valued Aboriginal food, called the Sydney cockle. It lives in the sand and filters the water for plankton using a siphon. These shells are from Cronulla Beach. Marine slugs graze on the seagrass. For defence they have an irritating purple dye and should not be touched. The marine compost of dead seagrass piles up on the beach and decays under the influence of bacteria, fungi and leaf hoppers. Here a tiny hermit crab carries a shell for its protection. On the beach itself are sizeable crab burrows and pellets. This ghost crab was not ready for me at dawn. It is usually nocturnal, coming out at night. It feeds on compost and carrion. The health of an estuary can be measured by the area and density of its seagrass beds. Also of importance is the survival of its mangrove swamps that trap muddy sediment from the land. Colourful mangrove crabs dig burrows in the mud, stake out their territories and feed on detritus. The mangroves are vital nurseries for schools of mullet that will grow and migrate to the sea. This highly poisonous toad searches for morsels in the mud. Eat him and your breathing stops. Human activity destroys both habitats. Plastic waste litters the estuary. Phosphorus rich nutrients such as manures and fertilisers trigger the growth of oxygen depleting green organisms. Power boats grind out the seagrass. Boat moorings dig out circular holes into the seagrass beds. Worldwide, the catch of edible fish species is in serious decline. Our coastal trawler numbers have dropped. If we look after our estuaries, our children may still be able to eat the following species. But without suitable habitat, they will disappear.
the development of Foster's Wallace Lake has produced some environmental problems. This shot looking down on Booty Booty shows a long sandbar closing Wallace Lake from the sea. North of Booty Booty is Cape Hook, known by Captain Cook. You can see One Mile Beach in the distance. The pioneering Dunn family members ran cattle here at Coomba and Baraduck to the south. What attracted people to the area was timber, particularly cedar for buildings, ships and export. An early survey of Foster showed it to be swampy. The entrance was rocky and too shallow for ships. So eventually a break wall had to be built. The Miles, Breckenridge and Wright families pushed in by bullock drays in the 1860s. They built sailing ships and steam-powered tugs on both sides of the estuary and at Falford. The Miles shipyard and floating timber yard occupied this area until it burned down in the Great Depression. Tourists earn $200 million per year and come to swim and fish. The coastal dunes form a reservoir of sand for the beach and are meant to be protected by vegetation. This shot shows Foster Main Beach in 1958. High-rise flats were built on the dunes and a wall built. At one mile, housing was built on the dunes which are eroding away in violent windstorms. In 1958, this ferry brought cars between Tuncurry and Foster. Then a bridge was built. What followed was canal developments, allowing more people to have a waterfront. The first settlers dug wells and pit toilets. People died of typhoid fever linked to contaminated water. In more modern times, septic tanks were installed, which often leaked into the estuaries. Foster oysters are worth $14 million per year. In 1997, hundreds of oyster eaters and their families became very sick with hepatitis A. It is a virus that attacks the liver, a vital organ. It causes yellow jaundice and can kill. The virus was found in the Wallace Lake oysters. The farmer ceased production, recalled oysters and had no income for some time. The scientists were called in. It was a community problem, not just for oyster growers. Other seafoods could be impacted as well. The local council imposed an environmental levy and empowered the experts. The initial problem was to check for sewer overflows and septic tank leakages. Streams and stormwater pipes that lead to the lake can carry waste and various types of phosphorus-rich nutrients and poos. The replanting of wetlands with grasses and reeds filters the nutrients. The council resumed land to create artificial wetlands. Plants are always better than pipes and concrete near the lake. Cattle is another focus. They churn up the grass and dump cow pats that can wash into the lake. Efficient farmers use fencing to keep them away from the water and move their cattle around the high ground to prevent overgrazing. That way the cattle are much healthier. Acid sulphate soils near casuarina trees should be separate from cattle. Otherwise you get this bacterial brew coming out of the soil. Bodoiners avoid dumping sewage into the lake. Now the lake has been declared safe. The trawlers are back together with the lake prawn fishermen. The oyster industry has recovered and is vigilant. Good science and community awareness and discipline are the keys to a vibrant future. <laughs>